The American Enterprise Institute presents the Distinguished Lecture Series on the Bicentennial of the United States. Our host for this thought-provoking series is Vermont Royster, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist with the Wall Street Journal and Professor of Journalism and Public Affairs at the University of North Carolina. I'm Martin Diamond, and I have the privilege of substituting today for Vermont Royster, the regular host for this series, but who is himself today's lecturer. This is, then, another in the American Enterprise Institute series of distinguished lectures on the American Bicentennial. Some of the nation's leading scholars and educators have been invited by the AEI to discuss their views on the American Bicentennial as part of the Institute's continuing program for promoting public discussion of the major issues of our times. The AEI is a nonprofit institution located in Washington, D.C. In this lecture, the AEI speaker will be Vermont Royster, contributing editor of the Wall Street Journal and professor of journalism and public affairs at the University of North Carolina. Stanford University, near Palo Alto, California, is the site of today's lecture. Stanford has one of the nation's leading departments of journalism and communications. Stanford was founded in 1891 by Leland Stanford, who served as California's governor during the Civil War years and later as United States Senator. He was also one of the prime movers behind the first transcontinental railroad. It was Stanford who drove the famous Golden Spike into the last railroad tie where the tracks from the east met those from the west. Today, Stanford is one of the most respected universities in the nation. The number of students who apply for admission each year is eight times greater than the number accepted. Those students who are enrolled are rewarded with a full academic program to choose from, as well as the full range of extracurricular campus activities. Stanford students take full advantage of the mild California climate, and outdoor activities are conducted on a year-round basis. Classes are sometimes held outdoors, and informal discussion groups on the many lawns and park areas of the campus are a common sight. Students can eat in many outdoor restaurant areas, and the bicycle is a common mode of transportation to and from classes. Outdoor bazaars dot the student union area, where students and others can display and sell handicrafts and other articles. Despite the pleasant surroundings, a degree from Stanford is not conferred lightly. Richard W. Lyman, the president of Stanford, put it this way. A comfortable university is virtually a contradiction in terms. We exist to disturb and activate the minds of men and women. Few things are more surely fatal to the life of the mind than is a smothering consensus. One of the tasks of today's AEI lecturer, Vermont Royster, will be to help disturb and activate the minds of his Stanford audience. He will speak in Dinkenspiel Auditorium, where he is being introduced by William Rivers, former Washington correspondent and now professor of communications at Stanford University. Mr. Royster and the Wall Street Journal have prospered together. He joined the journal in 1936 and began covering the White House, Congress, and the Supreme Court the same year. He later became chief Washington correspondent, associate editor, senior associate editor, and from 1958 to 1971, editor. While he was editor, close observers of journalism began to mention the journal in the same breath with the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times. In the middle of his period with the journal, Vermont Royster won a Pulitzer Prize. Perhaps the chief reason for Mr. Royster's journalistic eminence is he knows how to impose structure on the chaos of public affairs. 
He seems never to have been afflicted, like so many of us, with the herd instinct that leads to one of the worst faults of journalism, pack journalism, in which so many reporters seem to sniff out the same story and treat it in much the same way. The quality that enables Vermont Royster to avoid such an affliction reminds us of Walter Lippmann's thought, when everyone is thinking alike, no one is thinking much. The ability to think for himself has enabled Mr. Royster to command the respect of both right and left. Columnist James Kilpatrick told me recently that Royster is the figure in journalism who sets a towering example for Kilpatrick's own work. He refers to Royster as a superb writer and a clear thinker. Stanford's Bruce Bliven, who was long the editor of the liberal New Republic, has said, I have read him from the beginning of his career, sometimes with disagreement, always with interest and respect. Mr. Royster, there may be disagreement tonight, but we welcome you with interest, respect, and great pleasure. Vice President Miller, Professor Rivers, fellow students, and ladies and gentlemen, and mostly, especially, uh, my wife, my wife Frances. Frances, would you just stand up for a moment, please? <laughs> you see, from, from what I read in the newspapers, I understand that in California, anyone in the public arena had best pay attention to his wife. <laughs> I very much appreciate that kind and very flattering introduction, Bill. You've been most kind and, and generous. I also very much appreciate the opportunity to participate in this series of lectures by the American Enterprise Institute to celebrate the bicentennial of our revolution. A nation, like an individual, is the sum of all its yesterdays. And in so many areas of our national life, our laws, our politics, our economic system, we can understand better where we are and perhaps see clearer where we are going if we understand where we came from. This is certainly true in the particular area of our national life, which we're going to talk about this evening, the role of the press, or as it's sometimes called, the media. And I'm grateful to AEI for giving me this chance to share with you some of my thoughts on how the American press came to be, for good or for ill, what it is today. Among the many revolutionary ideas to emerge from the American Revolution, none has proved more revolutionary than the idea of freedom of the press. None has proved more durable, for it has withstood two centuries of assault. And none has proved more controversy, provide brewed more controversy, for it remains even in this country today as revolutionary an idea as it was in the beginning. And the many changes that time has worked on the political idea of the Founding Fathers, none would surprise them and perhaps disturb them than what has evolved in the succeeding two centuries from their views of what constitutes freedom of the press. All the evidence suggests that when they embraced this philosophical idea and embodied it in our First Amendment, they knew not what they wrought. Certainly when they spoke of freedom of the press, they did not envision a press of very nearly unrestrained license, which for all practical purposes is the legal privilege of the 20th century American press. That idea was foreign to the liberal philosophers, mostly those of the 17th and 18th centuries, from whom they drew their concepts about the nature of man and society and on which they founded the American political system. Nor was there anything in their own experience, even in the midst of a rebellion against a distant government, that led them to suppose a civil liberty, whatever its nature, could be severed from civic responsibility and therefore from all restraint. They thought this especially true when one liberty or one inalienable right, if you prefer, clashed 
with another. Nonetheless, that we have come so far is, I think, a logical extension of those very ideas about man and society and the nature of political freedom that permeated the thinking of those who embarked on the American experiment. Just as other of their ideas set in motion political events they did not fully anticipate, so it is here. Their declaration that all men are created free and equal inevitably led not only to the abolition of slavery, but to universal suffrage and to an ever-widening concept of civil rights. So with the declaration that freedom of the speech and of the press shall not be abridged. That declaration once made, it became ever more difficult to find a point of abridgment. There's also, however, another reason why in the area of political reporting and publishing, the American press has pushed the borders of permissible freedom beyond those in any other country, including those which share our political heritage, such as Great Britain itself. And that reason, I think, lies in geography that in the time before and during our rebellion, the colonies were both remote from the mother country and separated from each other. Geography made restraints less practical, the opportunities for freedom of expression more available. Ideas fertilized the American Revolution. It could hardly have come without them. Geography made its success possible it was that great gulf of ocean that, in the end, made it impossible for the British government to put it down. And these same two things, ideas and geography, also provided the soil for the revolutionary tradition of the American press, a tradition suspicious of all government and fiercely opposed to all restraint. In two centuries, it has proved a lasting tradition. In England, which is the principal source of our political heritage, the 16th century had ended with absolutism triumphant. By the end of the 17th century, having suffered the absolutism of Cromwell, England was a ferment of liberal ideas. The Declaration of Rights of 1689, forced upon William and Mary as the price of their crowns, foreshadows in many particulars not only our own Declaration of Independence, but later provisions in our Constitution. It proclaimed, among other things, that at least in Parliament there must be freedom of debate. And this was the century, too, as you will remember, of John Locke with his thesis of popular sovereignty, under which government was merely the trustee of power delegated by the people and which the people could withdraw. And it was the century of John Milton, who in his Areopagitica argued that men can distinguish between right and wrong ideas if they are allowed to meet in open encounter. Locke sowed the seed of rebellion, Milton the seed of the First Amendment. Still, at the beginning of the 18th century, they were seeds only. Milton, like Locke, spoke a minority view. Moreover, Milton himself whose motivation was irritation at Puritan censorship of his own theology, would not extend the full freedom of expression to Roman Catholics or to insidious pamphleteers or journalists. And no matter how majestic his argument, it had small effect even upon the intellectual men of his time and none at all upon the political authorities. In England, as elsewhere, the printing press remained subservient to the needs of the state. And when the first small cracks did appear in the system of press control, and here, of course, we're speaking primarily of books and pamphlets, not newspapers as we know them today, these cracks were caused less by the pressure of ideas than by the practical difficulties of enforcement. We are watching Vermont Royster discussing the American press and the revolutionary tradition. Mr. Royster has been reviewing the birth of our tradition of a free press. In just one moment, he continues. Stanford University stands on what was once a stock farm owned by Leland Stanford, and the campus is still known to its students as The Farm.
But long before Lille and Stanford owned the land, back in 1769, a part of what is now the campus was used as a campsite by explorer Gaspar de Portola. From this campsite, Portola's men marched north some 35 miles, where they discovered San Francisco Bay and explored what is now San Francisco. While Portola was exploring the shores of the Pacific, some men on the shores of the Atlantic were exploring a much more subtle matter, freedom of the press. Our AEI lecturer, Vermont Royster, is now addressing himself to that exploration. Until well into the 17th century, the printing press was controlled in England by a system of patents, that is, licenses. The Crown gave patents to a group of printers organized into the stationers' company. And this company had the power to admit and expel members from the printing trade and to discipline the members for such transgressions as might be charged against them by the authorities. For some 200 years, this system worked well in controlling the press, the stationers' company being assiduous to protect its monopoly. It began to break down only as technology made printing cheap and therefore readily available. By the beginning of the 18th century, the proliferation of presses had made it impossible to enforce the licensing system and equally impractical for an official censor to read and approve every piece of printed matter before it was published. Practicality then demanded both a different system and a different rationale, legal and philosophical, to justify any restraint. The English answer to this problem was both ingenious and far-reaching in its effects. Necessity forced the abandonment of prior restraint on publication. In its place was substituted the idea that the printer, while he could not be restrained in advance, could be held accountable afterwards for what he published. Gradually, what could not be prevented came to be hailed as an inalienable right. What could be adjudicated came to be accepted as a proper restraint upon that right. And in time, this concept of the freedom of the press, its extent and its limitations, was debated and shaped by men as varied as Dr. Samuel Johnson and Sir William Blackstone. Blackstone most especially. But well, this English jurist not only capsuled the new philosophy and the new law of the press in his famous commentaries, but he was also the great teacher for the law-minded revolutionists in the colony. Today, I suppose, few lawyers read his commentaries even as a classic. But in the latter part of the 18th century and through much of the 19th century, his influence on American jurisprudence was immense, far greater than in his own country. Before the advent of law schools, every budding lawyer began his reading with Blackstone as his guide and oracle. And Blackstone's obiter dicta on the common law were pervasive among those who launched and nurtured our experiment in political liberty. In his commentaries, first delivered as lectures in 1758 and formally published in 1765, just a decade before Bunker Hill, Blackstone defined the freedom of the press this way, and I quote, the liberty of the press is indeed essential to the nature of a free state, but this consists in laying no previous restraints upon publication and not in censure from criminal matter when published. Every freeman has an undoubted right to lay what sentiments he pleases before the public. To forbid this is to destroy the freedom of the press. But if he publishes what is improper, mischievous, or illegal, he must take the consequences of his own temerity. There, in two sentences from Mr. Blackstone, is the whole of the law and the philosophy of the press as it appeared to Englishmen of the 18th century, including our own revolutionists. In 1734, the royal governor of the colony of New York was one William Cosby, by the evidence of his contemporaries, an avaricious, haughty, 
an ill-tempered man. The publisher of the New York Weekly Journal, a four-page poorly printed sheet, was John Peter Zenger, an itinerant printer. Before the year was out, they were to clash with consequences neither of them foresaw. The origin of it, briefly, was a dispute between the governor and the council. And as part of that dispute, Cosby discharged the colony's chief justice and appointed in his place a royalist supporter. Zenger's print shop issued a pamphlet giving the deposed chief justice's side of the case. And there began a long and acrimonious fight between the royal governor and the weekly journal. Ultimately, Governor Cosby had Zenger jailed the charge seditious libel. Now, Zenger, who had not written the offending articles, but who had published them, languished in jail for nine months, and the next year, 1735, he came to trial. It was a disappointing trial. If the hope was that the issue of freedom of the press from seditious libel would be squarely joined, Zenger's counsel was Andrew Hamilton, not to be confused with Alexander Hamilton. And Andrew Hamilton saw his task, as lawyers are wont to do, to free his client rather than to win some great judicial principle. Thus, Ham Hamilton did not attack the concept of seditious libel. Instead, he argued that it was designed to protect the king, not provincial governors and that if the people could not remonstrate truthfully against despotic governors, the people would lose their liberty and the king would be ill-served. And then in an impassioned appeal directly to the jurors, he asked them, in effect, to ignore the court's rulings on the law and to acquit Zenga notwithstanding. And that is what the jury did quite possibly for no other reason than that Cosby was an unpopular governor, and this was a way to strike back at him. Anyway, the Zenger case did nothing to alter the common law of seditious libel, nor to advance any new principles with regard to freedom of the press. Nonetheless, the Zenger trial is justly renowned in the history of the colonial press. Cosby has vanished into obscurity. Zenger took his place in the pantheon of journalistic heroes. In a very dramatic fashion, a small newspaper had challenged royal authority, been brought to trial by a royal court, and acquitted by a jury of colonial citizens. And that was enough. Now, there were other cases before and after Zenger with varying results. As early as 1692, one William Bradford, a Philadelphia printer, had been tried for seditious libel, Thomas Small for the same charge in Boston in 1696, neither of whom was ultimately imprisoned. But Andrew Bradford, William's son, was later imprisoned for publishing a letter critical of the English government, and Benjamin Franklin's brother was jailed for being critical of the Massachusetts colonial government, and also in Massachusetts, one John uh, Checkley was convicted for distributing a book critical of Calvinist doctrines. Until the eve of the revolution, there was little consistency, either from time to time or from colony to colony, in the boldness of printers or in the reaction of authorities to criticism. For the most part, however, boldness was not characteristic of those early printers. Their shops were commercial enterprises. They actually sought out official business and were inclined to do little to disturb it. They also shared the general attitude of the time, which consisted of much grumbling at particular authority, but without any real disposition to challenge the principle of authority from the crown. Now, this is not the place for recounting the history of the colonial press. It should be noted, though, that the present view of colonial America as a society, that everywhere cherished freedom of ideas and expression is a romantic one. There was indeed an enormous diversity of political and religious ideas among the various colonies due to their origins and their geography. 
And this diversity was ultimately to have an enormous effect. But each colony had its own orthodoxy and guarded it zealously, being quite willing to suppress the dissonance of the non-orthodox, whether political or religious. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Vermont Royster has been discussing the American press and the revolutionary tradition. In just one moment, Mr. Royster continues his lecture from Stanford University. The architecture at Stanford University is generally ranked with the most outstanding of any campus in the nation. The Memorial Church is famous for its mosaics and stained glass windows, while other campus buildings range from this classic style of the 1800s to modern masterpieces designed by such architects as Edward Durrell Stone. Looking at the campus today, it is difficult to believe that the great earthquake of 1906 that destroyed San Francisco also leveled much of Stanford. One of the most modern buildings on campus today is Dinkelspiel Auditorium, where Vermont Royster is continuing his lecture on the American tradition of a free press. But what did result from the revolution? If not new philosophies about freedom of the press were habits and an attitude. The attitude, natural under the circumstances, was one of antagonism to government, or at least distant government. After all, that was the root of the revolution itself. The habits were of fiercely venting that antagonism without check, at least from any distant government. In a very pragmatic way, these two things were to have important consequences. For one, they bestowed a renewed interest among publishers, writers, and intellectuals generally in philosophical thinking about the nature of a free press if for no other reason than to find a respectable rationale for what these writers and printers were in fact doing. The other consequence was that in time, the revolutionary habit became transformed into a tradition. Neither the habits of free speaking nor critical attitude toward distant government were, to be sure, limited to printers. Both had been acquired by the colonists generally. In fact, when the Constitutional Convention convened in 1787, the delegates there in Philadelphia had two problems. One was to devise an acceptable and workable form of a national government. The other was to persuade the citizens of the new state to accept any national government stronger than a loose confederation. And the extent of this second problem shows up clearly in the Federalist Papers of Madison, Hamilton, and Jay. Again and again, while defending the structure of the proposed government, they also had to answer critics of the very concept of a national government. Eight of the papers are devoted to explaining the inadequacies of the original confederation. One is devoted wholly to justifying the need for a central government and another to explaining away the need of any further checks on the power of the national government. Nonetheless, in the end, they had to accept such additional checks, known as the Bill of Rights, in order to get their government accepted. Now, one of these checks, embodied in the First Amendment was that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. But this was not then the sweeping doctrine that it has since come to appear. The key word here is Congress. That is, the national government was to be prohibited from abridging the press. What was done under state governments was to be left to the states. They were not prohibited from regulating the press. Indeed, in the Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1790 and the Delaware Constitution of 1792 expressly imposed liability for abuses of freedom of speech and of the press. Even in Virginia, a 1792 statute provided sanctions against abusive uses of freedom of the speech. Thomas Jefferson explained while we deny that Congress have the right to control the freedom of the press, we have ever asserted the right of the states and their exclusive right to do so. 
Jefferson, having made now his entrance into our story, is perhaps worth a moment's pause. He has, with some reason, become the patron saint of the press, having proclaimed that if he had to choose between government and no newspapers, or, new, or newspapers and no government, he would do without government. But Jefferson also reflected other views of the press not untypical of his time. His 1783 draft for the Virginia Constitution provided that the press should be subject to no restraints other than legal prosecution for false facts printed and published. And again, in a letter to Madison, he remarked, a declaration that the federal government will never restrain the presses from printing anything they please will not take away the liability of printers for false facts printed. That view, as you can see, is essentially Blackstonian. Uh, on seditious libel, Jefferson was ambiguous, or at least changeable. In 1803, angered by its licentiousness and its lying, he thought the press ought to be restrained by the states, if not by the federal government. I've long thought, Jefferson wrote, that a few prosecutions of the most prominent offenders would have a wholesome effect in restoring the integrity of the presses. Yet as president, he pardoned those convicted under the Sedition Act of 1798. And finally, of course, like all presidents before or since, Jefferson had a low opinion of the performance of the press and angrily assailed their calumnies against him and against the government. Jefferson, like scripture, can be quoted to one's own purposes. The next great leap forward for the freedom of the press, both its philosophy and its practice, came, as a matter of fact, from that 1798 Sedition Act. This law made it a crime to publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writing, bringing into disrepute the government, the Congress, or the president and it immediately plunged the country into a bitter controversy. The press was outraged. The victims among newspapers included the New York Argus, the Boston Independent Chronicle, and the Richmond Examiner. One of the more famous trials was of Thomas Cooper, who in the Reading Weekly Advertiser had called President John Adams an incompetent and was imprisoned for six months of perhaps passing interest is the fact that it is at his trial, Cooper tried to get Adams as a witness, but the court refused to subpoena the president. <laughs> anyway, the Sedition Act forced people to rethink their views on the nature of press freedom. In the Virginia resolutions against the Sedition Act, James Madison brought forth a new concept. Noting the common law principle that freedom of the press was limited to imposing no previous restraints on publication, Madison said that could not be the American idea of press freedom, since a law inflicting penalties afterwards would have a similar effect to a law imposing previous restraint. It would seem a mockery, he wrote, to say that no law should be passed preventing publication, but that laws might be passed punishing them in case they should be made. And for the first time, a loud voice, that of George Hay, prosecutor of Aaron Burr and later a federal judge, was raised to proclaim the idea that freedom of the press was absolute in terms of criticizing the government, whether the criticism be true, false, malicious, or otherwise. Freedom of the press, Hay proclaimed, means total exemption of the press from any kind of legislative control. He would only admit act private actions against the press for private injury as for any other tort. These sweeping ideas of Madison and Hay were in advance of their own time. Indeed, the concept is not fully accepted even yet. Justices Doc Black and Douglas to the contrary. That the press should be free of all accountability to government, that is to society as a whole, for what it publishes, 
For in that extreme form, it raises all manner of political and philosophical questions that are still disturbing. Nonetheless, the outcome of the outcry at that time was that the Sedition Act was repealed. The press emerged freer than ever. Its habits of independence and its attitude of suspicion towards government strengthened. The stage was set for the development of the modern American press. The American press and the revolutionary tradition is the subject of this lecture by Vermont Royster, professor of journalism and current affairs at the University of North Carolina. In just one moment, Mr. Royster will continue. The most famous landmark on the Stanford campus is the Hoover Tower, which stands 285 feet above the campus floor. The structure honors Herbert Hoover, who went on from Stanford's first graduating class to become the 31st president of the United States. The tower houses the Hoover Institution on war, revolution, and peace, and contains a large collection of rare books and documents, including the most complete records on Adolf Hitler and the Nazi movement in existence. Elsewhere on the Stanford campus, at Dinkelspiel Auditorium, Vermont Royster is concluding his lecture on the American press and the revolutionary tradition. As we approach the last quarter of the 20th century, the American press occupies a unique position. By the word press, I refer, of course, not just to newspapers of mass circulation but to the whole of the press in all of its multiplicity and diversity, to the thousands of weekly papers and journals, to the little offset presses and portable duplicators of nameless number scattered in every town and hamlet turning out posters, pamphlets, handbills, and broadsides, to magazines overground and underground speaking the ideas of the respectable and the disreputable and aimed at whatever audience church corps, atheists, lesbians, militant blacks, or Ku Klux Klan whites, Puritan and prurient, reactionary or rebellious. Each of these is part of the press, and the whole of it is all of them. This American press, each part choosing what it will, can publish what it will. It can seize upon secrets stolen from government archives and broadcast them to the world. It can strip the privacy of councils and grand juries. It can pillory those accused of crimes before they are tried. It can heap calumnies not only upon elected governors, but upon all whom chance has made an object of public attention. It can publish the lascivious and the sadistic. It can advance any opinion on any subject, including the opinion that all our government is corrupt and that the whole of the social order proclaimed in 1776 should be swept away and another put in its place. This is unique. For such full freedom to publish exists nowhere else in the world. In many countries, nothing can be published, save with the imprimatur of some politburo. In others, the press has many of these freedoms, but in what other country is the press free to do all of these things with impunity? Even in that England, which is the wellspring of our liberties, there remain after 200 years official secret acts, strict libel laws, rigid rules on the reporting of judicial proceedings, and other restraints which put some limits upon the freedom of the press. In newer countries, the authorities have taken early heed against too much license. Only in America are the boundaries of freedom so broad. Let us go back for a moment and imagine how the argument for putting some restraints on the press might have been put by an articulate philosopher in the Crown colonies. It might have run something like this. Freedom of the press is essential to political liberty where men cannot freely convey their thoughts to one another. No freedom is secure. But freedom of the press to appeal to reason may always be construed as freedom of the press to appeal to public passions and ignorance, vulgarity, and cynicism. So it's always dangerous. 
The moral right of free public expression is not unconditional. When a man who claims the right as a liar, a prostitute whose political judgments can be bought, a dishonest inflamer of hatred and suspicion, his claim is groundless. To protect the press is not always to protect the community. Libel, obscenity, incitement to riot, sedition, these have a common principle. Their utterance invades vital social interest. So the extension of legal sanctions to these categories of abuse is justified. So might the argument have run. In fact, the above quotation is not imaginary. Every phrase of it is taken verbatim from the report on the Commission on Freedom of the Press done in the 20th century by a group of scholars and teachers, one of whom was an eminent philosopher and another the chancellor of the University of Chicago. No foes of liberty they, no blind reactionaries, no partisan politicians. All of them thoughtful men, deeply disturbed by the fear that the abuse of liberty can destroy liberty. The report of the Commission on Freedom of the Press, more popularly known as the Hutchins Commission, was issued in 1947. It was greeted by outrage cries from the press to whom it was heresy. And its import, without any question, was to challenge the absolutism of the idea of freedom of the press, threatening to take us back beyond Mill, beyond George Hay, beyond Madison Jefferson and John Peter Zenger. Now, true, the Hutchins Commission did not really grasp the nettle. That is, it did not say what ought to be done to restrain abuses of freedom of the press, or even who should be the judge of what they are, beyond the general thought that not every restraint on the press is wrong, and some strong urging that the press itself exercise some self-restraint. But the commission did remind us that the nettle is there. It always has been. The fundamental assumption of all who cherish freedom of the press and who have nourished it over the centuries is that it is the cornerstone of liberty. The safeguard of the citizens against tyranny is their freedom to remonstrate against despotic government. A society of self-governing people is viable only if the people are informed. And men have no way of discovering the best ideas about man and God or man and society. Unless all ideas are free to confront each other, the good and the bad, in the cauldron of the intellectual marketplace. Without the right of free inquiry, all other freedoms vanish. Such are the premises of free speech from Milton to our own day. And yet another assumption is that no man is free if he can be terrorized by his neighbor, whether by swords or by words. This is the justification of laws against violence, against libel and slander. Nor can a citizen be truly informed if falsehoods come masquerading as truth. False advertising for ideas is as injurious as those for foods or for drugs. Moreover, the liberty of the citizen also depends upon the stability of society, which is why governments exist. And society also has a right to protect itself against the predatory. Such are the premises of those who say no right is absolute, including freedom of the press, when it clashes with other rights. And therein lies the nettle, and it grows ever more prickly. If the right of a, free, of a fair trial is fundamental to liberty, what happens to it if the press is free to prejudice a fair trial by what it publishes? If it is wrong for other institutions of society to have power without responsibility, is it right for the press, surely one of the more powerful institutions of society, to have no accountability for what it does, these questions, raised a quarter of a century ago by the Hutchins Commission, are now disturbing others. 
In that Pentagon Papers case, the court reaffirmed the Blackstonian doctrine and refused to uphold prior restraint. But several of the justices were uneasy even with that as an absolute doctrine when it seemed to give sanction to, to the stealing of government documents. Justice White, for one, plainly said that while he would not restrain prior publication, he might well sustain a, a, a decision holding the newspapers accountable for their actions as receivers of stolen property. Freedom of the press, once proclaimed, admits of no logical limit. If the national legislature may not abridge it, by what logic should state legislatures? If all ideas should be freely expressed, how can information on which the ideas are based be suppressed? If government must be open, how can govern the governors keep secrets from the governed? And if the governors will not give information freely, is there not a, right, not a right to wrest it from them? Each progression, you see, leads inexorably to the next. In this country, there has also been the pressure of our historical experience, thrusting those boundaries ever outward. The very nature of our revolution created a bias first against distant government and then by extension against all government save that which governs least. Although the 20th century has forced an acceptance of enlarged government, it has in fact been a reluctant acceptance and it still divides the people. We remain unruly under the long arm of government as when mothers parade to protest school busing or truck drivers block highways to protest fuel allocation. And we remain equally suspicious of and hostile to other institutional sources of power as witnessed the recent outcry against the big oil companies. And this bias has been shared by those who report and comment on the news. And their habit of displaying it has been reinforced by the privilege of independence so fiercely fought for. Print the news and raise hell. That has been the traditional battle cry of the press. Except in rare moments, it matters not who holds the power. What president the reins of government, the press will soon be sniffing at his spoor and thundering at his actions. That such freedom can be abused is undeniable. Good men can be slandered justice thwarted, base passions aroused, people misinformed, government subverted, all institutions of society undermined. It should surprise no one that there arise from time to time voices asking how shall we protect ourselves. And as our society grows more complex, these voices will, I am sure, grow ever more clamorous. But this is true of all liberty. There is none that cannot be abused. And if the people cannot be trusted to find their way amid the abuses, then there is no hope for the American experiment. For that experiment rests less upon logic than upon a faith that the danger of unbounded liberty is not so great as that of putting liberty in bondage. It is a faith, I think, so far justified. In our 200 years, we have been better served by our freedoms, including most especially our freedom of speech and the press, than we would have been served without them. And that is the answer, and perhaps the only answer, to those who no longer trust those freedoms. All the same, the story is not ended. Freedom of religion, freedom of person under the protection of habeas corpus, trial by jury, freedom of the press. These principles, said Jefferson in his first inaugural, form the bright constellation which has gone before us and guided our steps through an age of revolution and reformation. Freedom of religion, 
habeas corpus, trial by jury, all of these have become so much a part of us, we hardly remember that they were things men once fought over. Of that constellation, only freedom of the press remains in the heat of controversy as revolutionary an idea now as it was in the beginning. Thank you very much for your patience. Vermont Royster has just concluded his lecture on the American press and the revolutionary tradition. Mr. Royster discussed the moral and legal development of a free press in this nation and its value to our society. This lecture has been one in a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute dealing with the many aspects of the American Revolution and how that revolution still affects America and the world today. If you would like a copy of Mr. Royster's lecture, or of the entire series, write the American Enterprise Institute, that's AEI, Post Office Box 19191, Washington, D.C., 20036. For Vermont Royster, this is Martin Diamond. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.